Hello folks, it's Michael with the Reason RX Podcast. Hope you're doing well. We're back again. Um, we've all been busy. Melanie's busy this weekend with family out of town, all her activities, her kids, her kids doing things. So she's unable to make it today. Um, but we've all been busy ending up uh, the school year final exams and all that, grading, tutoring, teaching, finishing it off. Um, so was that pretty busy for you, Scott? Yes, the end of the year is always busy, uh, making sure everything's in order, all the seniors trying to graduate, make sure they have things in order. Yeah. And as you can tell today, folks, our guest again is Scott Harris. <laughs> <laughs> so, um I'm still kind of recovering from stuff, so I'm a little slow. But we got your name out anyway. They know who you are. So, um, but yeah. And then I've been spending a while um, training for a fitness certification that I did at the end of May. I uh, went up to Dallas and got a uh, certification in as a MoveNat Level 2 instructor. Um, that was cool. Nice group of people up there. Um, there was level one on Saturday and Sunday. I did that last year, so and I didn't need to go to that. Then level two was Monday and Tuesday. Um, our, like the MoveNet master instructor, Eric Brown, was, like, leading us and certifying us. And a uh, nice group of people from around the country um, let me see, seven of us in total for this. There was a couple from the level one thing here were going to stay, but then they, uh, I don't know, stuff came up in their lives at home, so they had to leave. Couldn't stay, but Jay and Bill from out in California, Aiden from Alabama, um, Ethan from Dallas, um, Scott from Houston here, and Sean Sean, where were you from? I forgot. Dang it. But Sean. I got your name anyway, Sean. So don't hold it against me. <laughs> but uh, great group of folks out there. That was fun. We did a lot of stuff indoors. Did spend a day at Cedar Ridge Preserve or half a day, three hours. Vaulting, walking, running, jumping, carrying each other, dragging each other, climbing stuff. Um and of course, me being me, I was taking a lot of nature photos. I was like the little kid being left behind. Mom, Dad, wait up, wait up! <laughs> Don't leave me! But because I'd be there taking pictures of flowers and butterflies and all this other stuff. But uh, so it was a good time to get certified in level two. We have to do groundwork, breathing, posture, crawling. Balancing, walking, running, um, vaulting, climbing, throwing, catching, carrying, whole wide range of stuff. So, you know, you got to do a balanced hand foot crawl, what some people call a bear crawl, um, on your two by four, um, stuff like that, and be able to jump up and grab a bar, bar and then from a dead hang. Um, pop up on top of it you're not standing on it yet that's level 3 but um, you gotta have your waist against it and have your hands down and so your upper body's against it and you're straightened out do clean and jerk things like that so very very broad range of skills but it was cool you know everyone's good at everything but some people are always a little better at some things and some others, strengths and weaknesses and all that, preferences, what you train. So I'd be better at one thing than some others. They'd be better at me at these other things. But uh, nice stuff. Um, so um, I am now a certified official level two MoveNet fitness instructor. So that's nice. That's a big achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But... Uh, so, um, of course, been 
recovering from that and tutoring and trying to catch up on sleep and all this other stuff. So you're all good, Scott. You've caught up from end of the school year and grading and everything. Yes, I'm uh, ready to roll. We've uh, my final exams. I do Socratic seminars, so it's uh, refreshing for them that it's not something they have to try and cram for. But it's also uh, a much more useful skill in life than is taking a multiple choice exam. Hmm, cool. So it's not as stressful, I think, for uh, for hmm. them as their other classes. Is that <clears throat> all your classes, or just some of them, or what? No, I do all uh, for macroeconomics. We do um, a seminar on materialism and luxury and talk about how much money does it take to have to be happy. And there's actually research on this. So I have the kids guess and uh, we get some interesting, you know, oh, you only need 30,000 a year. Or some kids are like, you need at least 300,000 a year. <laughs> um, and, and the answer, according to psychologists, is 75,000. That past that, people don't self-report being any happier. Uh, you just have nicer stuff, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so then for psychology, we do one called Moral Skills and Motives. And we talk about um, should moral situations be rewarded or does that diminish them? Uh, and and how, how is the best way to encourage and grow morality in people? And we start with the example of uh, a kid drowning. You jump in and save them, and the parents offer a reward. Now, this was unsolicited. Is it okay to take it? And right there, we, we burn 10, 15 minutes. Some kids say yes. Some say no. Um, some say, point out that in some cultures, if I save your life, right, you're obligated then to serve me until either you've saved mine or kind of a requisite amount. And you're kind of relieving some of the guilt of the parents by accepting the gift. Mm -hmm. um, and so we go through questions like that. And then uh, philosophy, we do one on how much equality do we want. There's a great film out there called 2081. And it's a film adaptation of um, Kurt Vonnegut's short story, Harrison Bergeron. And it's a society in which the strong have to wear weights, the beautiful have to wear masks, Ballerinas have to wear sandbags because it's not fair that they jump higher than the other ballerinas. And so it's a nice dystopian 20-minute uh, film, and we yeah. watch that, and then the next day we have the seminar. Yeah, unlike some of the other things like that, that's a really, really – the the one you're talking about is a really, really, really short read. How many pages is it? Five or something? Ten? Ah, uh, yeah, it's maybe three, three or four tops, so it's a yeah. short read. Yeah, They're pretty good. Yeah, I've seen that. A little movie you're talking about pretty good um but cool and then how do you grade them if you're doing socratic things like that so um i was trained to do socratic seminars by michael strong i've had some other training as well but he has a great book called the habit of thought and it he lays out how to do socratic seminars so i took from his book kind of the key skills you're trying to train and assess and made a rubric from that mm -hmm. and I have them self-evaluate um, and and people initially think oh they'll just all give themselves hundreds yeah. quite the opposite I find them to be very um, all, almost perfectly accurate I, mm -hmm. I do obviously review and adjust their scores if necessary mm -hmm. and I keep notes as we're doing this about who's doing what yeah cool yeah. good but yeah speaking of that of like when I was going up to Dallas um I was listening to one of the books you recommended, uh, what, How to Read a Book by Adler. Yes. Got that on Audible, book, Audible and started reading that. It's, it's good. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I recommend it. And for those who don't want to read the full book or listen to the full book, he does have about a six-page condensation of it called How to Mark a Book. And that's a free PDF you can find online. Yeah, I found that too. Just haven't had time to read that yet, but yeah. But yeah, it's nice learning new things from what he says and patting myself on the back when I've thought of something that he says or, you know, I've learned it from someone else. You know, because like marking up a book, 
it's you need to have some instruction on it it helps but there it's out there in society it's not like uh, a super genius idea that only a few people are going to come up with a lot of people know about marking books there's you know underlining double underlining lines on the side squigglies circling starring all over the place so some of that I didn't think of on my own but I've assimilated it through the years from learning from other people well one of the best things I think his article or book does is gives you permission to write in books <laughs> because so many of us were taught that books are sacred and you don't damage them but if you really want to use them properly especially obviously if they're your own books um it's so much more helpful uh, when you look back six months, six years later, and you can pick up that whole book basically by reviewing your markings. Yeah, and I know in some books I've read before, if I look back like 20 or 30 years, I wouldn't want to read that copy because I'd look back and I'd be embarrassed at how stupid I was from <laughs> the most of I did. I thought that was smart. Oh my gosh, that is so stupid. <laughs> Well, and I found my marking system when I, after I read Adler and I first started marking in books, I, I look back now and realize I didn't mark enough, hmm. that I was still kind of gingerly marking here and there. Uh, then I maybe went a little bit in the other direction where I was marking a whole lot and I've kind of found that happy balance now um, to what's what's really central, the, the message of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah good stuff but yeah and so that's a book um, we I think we'd both recommend for a lot of people to read and ironically enough it's a it's how to read a book and I'm listening to it on audible <laughs> 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 but it works can't read while I'm driving to Dallas <laughs> not a good idea so we'd recommend it that'll help because one, you know, there's a lot of stuff we have to write about, which is our topic for today, writing. And as we talked about la uh, last time with Scott, um, a lot we can write about just on our own, and we'll get into some of that. But one thing we can write about is a book. And that's, um, so we wanted to have uh, writing part two to dig into this a little bit, because I think it's pretty clear for some people because of their schooling how to write in some areas like everyone knows you write stuff in English like you read a book and you write about it now unfortunately that might have made some people hate some books um, like maybe overanalyzing some Shakespeare or some literature Adler addresses that point too how that's wrong um, you got to read through it for the pleasure of it that's the most important thing what you get out of it um then he'll say when you're reading read through it first time as quick as you can um then you, you get, once you have the whole you know what the big picture is then you can start analyzing it he does not like analyzing it before you've gone through it which is you know analyzing it too much is what people do um when they're going through it nowadays um and then, you know, some teachers could do a balance, like some books you just read. But then you got to do Scott's idea of write a summary on a 3 by 5 or 4 by 6 note card or have a short little outline. Then they don't got to do much. It takes a lot of the stress out of it. Just read it. Um, then there can be other books where you delve into it more. Or just as I have Melanie's kids write essays over numerous times, we have many drafts before... I let him go on to a new one. Um, that's the only way to really learn to write. Same thing, I think, with reading. If you're going to learn to read really well, you got to go through a book numerous times. Like, uh, you'll notice is years go by and you get a um, little more knowledge, a little more wisdom about the world. You see more in a book than you did before. Or you realize you missed something when you were reading. So, and as, as as we've mentioned before, reading good writers is a great way to improve your writing. Yeah. When you see people who really have a command of the craft, uh, you really just pick up lots of uh, tips and stylistic um, things as you read. Yeah, agreed. I know from my own experience, I sure did. 
then you learn to appreciate why it's important to do that. You see what someone can say and the power of their thought through writing. Whereas if someone doesn't ever read good writing, then they're not really seeing as well how important it is or the kind of impact they can make. They just have a bad idea that all writing is lame and boring. And, and that's one problem with modern textbooks. They may be um, more efficient at conveying information, uh, but they're certainly not eloquent in any way. They've really been kind of, oh, I'm, I'm saying they're dumbed down because they're not, but they've been watered down a bit as far as what the uh, reading level, the lexile percentage, the grade level is often kind of drawn toward the lowest common denominator. and in an attempt uh, to do that and convey information as easily as possible, they've kind of sucked all of the, the nice writing and you know mm-hmm. something that can make you feel moved. And I'm thinking of history books in particular mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then kids complain that it's just sterile dates and facts. Yeah. Yeah, it's one thing, like I say. Um, some people think, well, like math is useless or they hate math or history or science or whatever this is boring and useless um but they're making a mistake because they don't know any better um they don't have the perspective to see it what they really don't like is how it's taught they don't know whether they hate math or hate science or if it's useless or not because it's all confused together for them it's all this one thing and they can't differentiate the aspects that are good and bad and it's some bad I, tools that the teacher has and is forced to use or things they don't know. I mean, I sure the heck didn't know better before I learned some stuff about really how to teach subjects better and what really mattered, um, you know, because of the culture we're brought up in and how things are done. But you get the philosophy right, um, and then it's a lot more interesting and you can teach a lot better. So the how is a big driving important factor in this whole thing, not just the subject itself, how it's done. A good example of that would be a gentleman named Hans Rosling, and he just died a few years ago. Um, But he takes statistics on life expectancy, infant mortality, GDP per capita, per country, stuff that's really boring. And he plugs it into um, some great visuals. And you can go to the website gapminder.org. And there's a lot of stuff to play around with there. But he he makes the data so fascinating with uh, how it's presented. And you can see different countries growing over time and so on. Uh, but he's also so excited about his own subject. And he's got a great, I think it's a Swedish accent. He's just fascinating to listen to. And here he's explaining income quintiles within two different countries in Africa. And you're like, yes, Hans, tell me more. It's so fascinating. Yeah. yeah. What's his last name? Uh, Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G. Cool. Yeah. Um, there's someone else who's really good with statistics and data analysis. Don't recall his name right now. Oh, Edward Tuft. Mm-hmm. Edward tough to t-u-f-t-e yes he's got some beautiful um beautiful stuff up on his website um but that's all another subject we could discuss in the future well it's it's actually so i have a colleague who i showed uh my colleague tuff's work and the website he ended up he teaches world history and he bought the the famous map or drawing that Tuft made about Napoleon's troops hmm. uh, marching to Russia and then back. Um, or was it Hitler's troops? I guess it was Napoleon's. Um, and so there's a tremendous amount of information conveyed in one small chart. Basically, it, it's the thickness of the line as it goes toward Moscow and coming hmm. back. It conveys how many troops died along the way. Hmm. And it's considered one of the single best presentations of complex information in a simple way. And that's precisely what we want to do with writing, is take complex information, funnel it, you know, synthesize it, and make it conveyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Again, 
sense. We'll have to discuss all that more in the future. That's like interesting stuff. Beautiful work. But, uh, so, um, as we say, reading, very important to writing. There's a lot of things you can get there, um, as we were saying. Uh, a lot of people know everyday life. Um, you write a lot in English about literature and stuff like that. But, oh yeah, and we write in history to some extent too. Um, that's where um, if there's going to be any writing, mostly it's there. And so we'll talk about more of that. One thing I wanted today to, day, to do today too was give people some ideas about how writing could be utilized in other areas like the sciences. Um, because people do too many word problems and don't think and reason and be logical fully enough in those. Um, so a lot of people would think physics, uh, just math problems. Chemistry, just a bunch of math problems. Math, just a bunch of math problems. But there's a lot of writing we can actually do, especially in like, might be easier in some biology, might be a good place to start astronomy. Um, as I think we've, yeah, we've discussed some time or other, but you know, one thing specifically is to have students or children, um, you know, so this is relevant for whether, like, if you're a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're a homeschool parent, if you're a business professional wanting to make their own writing better and more, you know, this applies to everybody. Um, and I'll put some stuff up. Like, you look on the internet, search it up yourself, folks. A lot of people out there in companies constantly talk about how um, business writing is poor, how the employees at companies cannot write well, and a lot of them have to train their own employees. I don't care if they've been through college. They've been through high school. They've been through college. does not matter. They cannot write well. And you've seen some of that too, Scott, like in Forbes and stuff, right? Yes. Well, I've mentioned this before, but I will never stop mentioning it. The writers, <laughs> the writers of directions, it is amazing to me that people think they're clearly conveying information. Um, and end of school procedures. All right, there's a lot of uh, memos coming out right now on what we need to do uh, for any year. And boy, some of the information is just not being conveyed clearly. Mm -hmm. And that's a thought process. It happens um, through writing, I guess, um, but they don't seem to have thought these things through. And, and part of it, again, is that curse of knowledge that they know how it's supposed to go together, but you have to explain it to someone who doesn't know. Mm -hmm. and, and we see this with teachers all the time. Because they know, they think it's easier to understand than it really is. Yeah, true. Yeah. I like uh, yeah your idea that you said in the prior, one of the prior podcasts about uh, when your students write something and then you say okay now tell me as if I'm a fourth grader <laughs> yeah and they can do it yeah. and they're like well that's how you need to write <laughs> to someone you know because this comes up in their academic essays as well is since they know we know history or whatever they make certain presumptions. Well, you can't presume that the reader knows those things. You have to make the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Learn to have a good, concise argument. And, and that's where, you know, this is a good place to bring in some philosophy. Um, when you have a good epistemology, you know that all knowledge is integrated. It's connected, in other words, into one whole. That's what we mean by integration here. Um, you have all these individual pieces of knowledge but to be rational and to have proper knowledge and understanding in a mind that functions all of our knowledge as much as we have the time for and everything must be connected to everything else so the point here is that geometry comes into play to help people learn a concise, efficient thought process. You know, I hear it time again, time and again, that's where a lot of people first see it. They've never seen reasoning 
or had experience with it until geometry. And so when people learn geometry properly and we think in principle and teachers apply it to all other areas instead of just like teaching it platonically like it has no relation to anything else and to, you know, to reality and all the subjects are different and unrelated, if we draw lessons from it, then students will be better writers because it's exactly what you said. They've got to have a concise argument laid out. What information do we need? Where do we start? It's like the given of a proof. What steps do we go through? What knowledge do we have to bring into play? And what's our conclusion? And Abraham and Lincoln it, you know, knew that, and that's why he studied geometry. And he said that explicitly in some of his speeches. And in what order should that information be conveyed? Yeah. Because often people front load a lot of stuff that should come later and vice versa. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and we'll put some links in the show notes, um, show um, how, you know, a lot of people out there, not just me, um, I learned from them, a lot of people talking about how a lot of business professionals cannot write very well. Um, so it's an important topic. And if you want some help, you know, come to Scott, come to me, um, get in contact and, you know, we can help you write better and work on thinking and logic skills fundamental to it. Um, but so we can do, you know, a lot of writing in English and history, as we say, write about characters. I think we talked about some of that in the past, like to learn some fiction writing, start with a story that's already told, like the little red hen or something and kind of tell it yourself or say what would happen before that or after that or use the characters in a different way and then have the children start making up their own um, similar thing with nonfiction. that's some of the stuff that uh, Ben Franklin did on purpose to deliberately to make himself a better writer read some nonfiction, um, pick out some key words and then write it on your own with those key words um, and then we could do different things like what Scott says, get some a book in biology um, or history and have the kids or a business professional or a, an adult learning, getting ready to teach their kids um, write on a 3 by 5 or 4 by 6 card a summary of the book or just on a piece of paper a one sentence summary or on a piece of paper make a short outline of the book those are some simple options because if we're going to write well we got to know the main idea and that's a great thing Adler brings that up in his uh, how to read a book book <laughs> so he says you got to have four questions when you're reading what's the main idea number one number two what are the details um, number three do you remember the other you probably don't it's been a while <laughs> number three what was number three four three and four I forgot oh my gosh Oh, yeah. Number three, is it true? And number four, how does it relate to other things and why is it important? So what is the big picture? What is the topic of the book? What are the details? Is it true, you know, in whole or in part? And why does it matter? So four questions for reading all books. But number one, as he says, what's the big picture? So that's important to have a focused piece of writing. Um being able to pick out a big picture and something else and then being able to write something that's stays on topic and doesn't ramble all around. I think I mentioned this article in a previous podcast, but it's worth a quick revisit. One of the articles I have them look at in economics is titled um, Fighting Forest Fires and Macroeconomic Stability. And it makes a comparison between forest fires uh, being largely a product of human management, that we've mismanaged forests to the point that we have so much undergrowth that when lightning hits, the whole forest goes. Mm -hmm. And when you look at a properly managed or a natural forest where mankind is not intervening as much, the trees are much further apart, there's less undergrowth, etc. And it's more like a quilt in which you have dense forest over here, there's a meadow from where lightning hit five years ago, and so on. And then they make the comparison to how the Federal Reserve manages the economy and so on, and that by stamping out all 
minor regional recessions, we build these systems that become too big to fail. Mm -hmm. All right, so pretty complex, two sets of topics that have a relation. It's about a four page article. Have them read that, and then they write a summary of it on the three by five card. But even there, I want them to go smaller. I said, your goal is to convey what's in that article in as few as lines as possible. And I look through them all and pull out the best two or three. And these kids in two to four lines have really synthesized uh, what's going on there and, and the principle behind both the economy and the forest in three or four lines. That's not bad for a 17 year old. Yeah. And uh, another thing that's interesting in that regard, um, in trying to stamp out all fires, then a bunch of tinder builds up, and then you have one big, huge fire, which kills most all the trees, whereas if it burned more naturally, and if they took care of it, if they managed nature in a natural way instead of an ignorant, uninformed way, there'd be more fires, but they'd burn through more quickly. Yes, and I have pictures of forests from the 1900s, and again, managed versus not. I actually had an argument with a guy who used to work for the forest department <laughs> yeah. online, and using the knowledge from this article and just well common Sweet. sense, he, he finally conceded Sweet. that we've we've quote protected them too much, and you really do have to remove yeah. some of that underbrush. And then, if you dig into the biology, there's some trees like pines must have fire in order to reproduce yes it's required for the seeds to get certain signals and to germinate and if the fire is too hot it'll kill them but if it's the temperature they've evolved for then they'll you know reproduce and go on whereas with no fire they don't have those signals they're not going to reproduce we're killing the forest then and many types of bark are thick enough to protect from fire, and that's what burns off that underbrush. But humans come in and stop that from happening. And then you get all the underbrush, which then becomes hot enough to, to burn through that bark, and that's when you lose 10,000 acres. Yeah, totally, right. But, uh, and so there, I mean, right there, people say, look, science is boring. However, we're going to write about science. It's a bunch of, like, math equations. No, that like that situation right there people could write a paragraph a, a short one page a whole volume of stuff about that situation and what's going on well i read an interesting article today about why allergy allergies have increased in urban areas and there's apparently statistical data for this but he went back and found that in 1949 the guidelines from the government for urban planning said to plant only male trees. Yeah, I saw your article that, yeah. Yeah, and now I first learned that there was a difference between male and female trees in some species, some yeah. species not, but that the male trees produce the pollen, the female, the one that drops the fruit. It would take uh, workers to pick up any pods or fruit uh, and therefore plant only male trees multiply that by a couple of decades and we have a lot more pollen than we used to yeah there's another thing um depending on the age of the kids they could have some research question where they got to look it up and see why something's the case and where it came from um with the internet you know things like you mentioned are not out of the scope of uh something like that even with libraries they could have done it but you know you got like almost every library or fingertips nowadays by comparison to what we had and, and there's an interesting way to engage kids in trees and pollen and, and all of that biology stuff that might not be particularly interesting. But in that article, they, they went to the local uh, nursery school and it was surrounded by trees that were really high pollen. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's an interesting, uh, arguably health problem, but a, but a way to get high school kids interested in a real way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if the culture were better, they'd be interested more in biology in the first place. But they're all sheltered and in, like, in a little bubble away from the sun and reality and biology, unfortunately. Not their fault. <laughs> Poor kids. But uh, we got to get them out and get them. We're part of nature. we got to, like, be true to our nature by being in nature. Um, 
but so yeah so they could read like I have uh, Melanie's kids do we read a book about biology and then write uh, an essay about it so we could do the three by five no card thing with the or the other you know ideas I mentioned or they could write an essay depending on the age of the kids um, just write a summary of the book and there you're writing in science um, and then depending on their age maybe it's just a paragraph summary maybe it's a page maybe it's two pages um, you got to look and develop things logically for each individual according to their age and cognitive abilities but uh, you could write a summary and then start having them do things with books like why is it important you can start having them put quotes from the book in the essay so first they just write stuff down um, then they make it a little longer then okay you got to have some quotes from the book to back up what you're saying um, you've got to go beyond just what's there and say why this is important say what you learned from it in a last paragraph maybe um, and then when they get better at that, bring in the requirement that they have one or two um, outside sources that they bring in other than the book. And then they do that for a while. And then, okay, now it's three or four. So when they're in uh, seventh grade, maybe one or two outside sources. Eighth grade, three or four outside sources. Um, and then when they're in high school, they can start to like, bring in more or read two or three books and write one essay um, you know comparing and contrasting uh, all those three books that's a, a great point you mentioned about bringing in outside sources um, one thing I tell them and as a young person people are going to take you seriously and when you have outside sources or you're quoting an authority in the field it gives credence to the argument that you're making mm -hmm. And it seems like an easy skill, but uh, in the one pagers we do with the Centopicons, they have to have one to two quotes supporting their viewpoint. It's amazing how many kids just take the quote and just paste it in there. Yeah. Like it, it has to do work, it has to support, or it has to show a transition in your theme. And mm -hmm. I think we kind of take that skill for granted that they know how to do that. Yeah, um, no, right. But yeah, for them, I know what you mean. It's like, okay, here's an elephant's trunk, and here's a seal, <laughs> the tusk of a seal, and here's a beak of a bird. And look, isn't this beautiful? No, it's monstrous. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, they got to learn how to put it together logically and how to make it flow in the essay. I know what you mean. Agreed. Um, and then know what part of it to have and what part of the... Um, quote not to have you know what's relevant to what you're saying so um, and then they could you know so there's a lot in biology they could do like that with books and then um, you know when you really develop those ideas there's a great deal because you write about a book and then okay what'd you learn from it that could be a lot or bringing outside sources then you can start having these huge essays or have one one pager that's really concise and beautiful you know if they mm -hmm. really learn to write well and you really do this because it as we've talked about writing is really important for our lives and living successful and being happy and how do you pronounce it scott um what did the greeks call it Eudaim eudaimonia yes eudaimonia happiness mm -hmm. that's what does it mean in greek it uh flourishing cool and another term, consilience, uh, is a Greek term meaning a, a jumping together of knowledge in that you mentioned earlier in this podcast about interdisciplinary, studying different fields. There's different types of writing for different fields. I listened to a podcast this week. I think the book is called Range. Mm -hmm. And he was... Uh, uh, I saw that. <laughs> he, yeah, we... Similar circles, but he <laughs> talks about how he read through the Nobel Prize winning speeches of these scientists and how they all, first of all, had hobbies that were in some aesthetic field like glass blowing or painting, something non-scientific, uh, that they also were kind of broad based and now things are becoming so specialized 
and this has been argued since C.P. Snow wrote that article, a tale, I think, a tale of two cultures back in the 1950s. And things are very specialized now compared to then. And that does give us some uh, some gains, but it also starts to block, and he argues in that podcast, that we're blocking some um, new production things because we can't think in a wide-ranging way. Yeah, I agree. And wisdom is not detailed and focused. Wisdom is big picture. You can't be super specialized in everything and be wise. It's a contradiction. Um but I got that book range. What's the subtitle? Like why it's important, more important to be a generalist in a specialized world or something like that. That probably why it's why a generalist can succeed in a specialized world or something. But yeah, seems like it'd be good. Who's the author? Do you remember? I don't. Um, I I'll think I was on my bike ride. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah. And then Baron Heinrich <laughs> who we've hit on, um, he, you know, world-class biologist, great thinker, independent. Um, he does a lot of things all in biology too. Like, uh, he's doesn't just focus on one little thing. Like some people get all hyper-focused on some little chemical and one aspect of an aspect of an aspect of biology but you know he's a naturalist and loves all of it and he's done cutting edge fundamental revolutionary work and how moths cool themselves down how wasps warm like warm themselves up to fly raven intelligence bee society he's you know a world class ultra marathoner he's still you can look up Brian Heinrich on the internet he's like still in the top 10 for the in america for the 50 mile 100 mile and 24 hour run you know um yeah all kinds of stuff and then people know about um richard Feynman, uh, the physicist however if you dig into his life i mean he was like in like investigating and kind of applying science towards people and investigating ants and he played the <clears throat> bongo drums and learned all this different stuff you know he just didn't oh hi i'm i'm richard the physics teacher <laughs> oh yeah. i don't how i don't know what the weather's like i can't talk about sports or anything <laughs> it's like so much of a misconception but yeah um and you know those those technical skills or the people doing coding or the the chemist who's looking at a particular problem they're certainly necessary in the world and help us give us breakthroughs but they solve particular problems like you said the big picture thinkers are the ones who are going to be in higher demand uh, especially in an increasingly complex and changing world you need different types of thought and and having your brain stretched in different ways instead of just science or just psychology. Yeah. And I don't know where it comes from. That'd be interesting to dig back culturally and philosophically, but the idea that we should specialize is anti-human, I think. Um, we should specialize, but we are specialized generalists as human beings. We're not like ants that have a specific task or something. As humans... You want to learn a lot about coding, but I don't care. You still got to have friends. You still have family. You still have other interests. You still got to get food and all this stuff. Um, you have to be a generalist by your nature. And then if someone's in coding and they start to learn about all these other areas, I think they would be better at their job. They'd be happier and they'd be wiser. Well, someone who's a coder um, studying biology and studying spontaneous order, right? True. There's a lot of parallels in nature with algorithms. True. Uh, I'm, I'm told since I'm not a coder. Information theory, right. Right, right. Math, all this, yeah. But, um, and I think there's a book by E.O. Wilson called Consilience. Yes. Um, I'd like to get that and listen to that. E.O. Wilson is a great biologist. Um, I've read a little bit of his works, but not enough. 
I have uh, his uh, first book is called On Human Nature. Huh. And that was, <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to say that. I'm listening to that now. <laughs> yeah, 1974, <laughs> and that launched the field of sociobiology, which we now call evolutionary biology. And he was an ant expert yeah. in the beginning. <laughs> um, but he, yeah, that book was very controversial when it first came out. Uh, because it implied that genetics influences behavior, which it does. Um, genetics influences a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have read his book, Consilience, as well. It's very good. Cool. Good. Thanks. Good to know. Yeah, he's got in that book uh, Four Principles of Science, and that's kind of a nice shorthand of uh, scientific thinking. Hmm. And we go over that in my psychology class to start the year. And those books... I would not recommend that someone have a younger student read and summarize <laughs> for like high school, late high school, or college, depending on the kid. Yeah. Yeah. Not appropriate for younger. For younger kids, they need to read age appropriate books in biology and all that. <clears throat> but, um, you know, you can contact Scott or I and we can make some recommendations. Um, I've got, like, you know, as I say, I've had Melanie's kids read a number of books so far. Um, for biology um, and then besides reading books and summarizing them segueing off from them some writing that could be done in the same way we got to start logically and smart and have elementary school students do something and then develop it more when you get older so they could Go to a nature area, or if they can't do that, look something up on the internet. Go to a nature area, describe what you see. So to make students learn how to observe firsthand. Because it can be done in biology with more appreciation than in physics or chemistry. Like, you know, okay, some boys are, in general, some girls too, but mostly boys are going to like machines and get a kick out of them and maybe want to write about those. Um, but girls are not going to want that as much. But I think both like biology because I think it's in our nature. That's something that like E.O. Wilson talks about, biophilia. Um, well, and, and, you know, an anatomy class, learning how our own body works because nobody really tells us. Same thing with taking psychology. It's kind of the owner's manual uh, for the human experience. And nobody really tells us these things and we kind of figure them out as we go but um, what what great information to have how your body works how your mind works mm -hmm. the extent yeah. that we know yeah um, and so they can go out to a park or whatever describe color texture um, relationships how they feel there's all kinds of things with the, the colors the shapes the textures and they're learning to observe that's something that Dr. Maria Montessori brought up and had explicitly designed in her curriculum and pedagogy, um, teaching kids how to use their senses because it's not a given. You know, they got to learn how to really differentiate um, haptically, you know, by touch, um, things they see, and then how to put it into words and describe it conceptually. Um, and so, they could do something where they're just talking about it, telling you or recording it. Uh, maybe have them make a video and put it online or something and then get into writing, um, do a lot of descriptions. Um, cause there's even like, it's important cause I know I've heard, I don't remember who it was, some biologist, um, when he'd train graduate students, he'd give them something to look at and he'd say, okay, I want you to write down a hundred things about this. And of course, most of them not, having learned how to be observant like Sherlock Holmes you know Sherlock Holmes was observant I'm not saying he wasn't observant they haven't learned to be observant as Sherlock Holmes was observant but they'd write maybe like three or five things or ten things and turn it in and that's all I can think of he'd say no go back and write a hundred things and eventually they would learn to be very observant about some biological thing a leaf a bacteria or whatever but it's not going to happen without practice. Um, and then that makes your writing better. You know, that'd make fiction better. If people could be more descriptive about 
people and hair color and where the hair was and how someone moved and textures and light indoors and light outdoors, the writing would be so much better. Well, and that's, um, you know, a fun game to play with kids. Um, training that, say, spies or FBI Secret Service, Special Forces, you know, to walk through a room and how many things did you observe? Yeah. How many sure. chairs were in the room? You opened the refrigerator. What was in it? Are you thinking you play these little games of who saw sure. what? Good point. Yeah. Or restaurants, cars. How many yellow, white you, cars did we go by on the way here? How many and teaching <laughs> situational awareness. How many people were in that last aisle on the grocery store that yeah. we went down? That's Just paying attention. Was, yeah, I was thinking of like being very observant has all kinds of benefits because then you start, you're paying attention to what's around you and it helps you avoid trouble. Then you can see like if you're used to knowing how many white cars you saw on the way going somewhere, then you're more likely to observe someone following you in their car or someone following you in a store or someone staring at you in an unusual way. You'll know what's normal and go, hmm, this girl or guy is staring at me weird. Um, I better seek safety. Yes. But, so, very important. Um, so there's a lot of ideas in biology there. Um, and then in physics and chemistry, if people look at the history of physics, um, then they'll see more how you can do, really can do a lot of writing in physics and chemistry be surprising like uh, look at some biographies of great chemists or great physicists great mathematicians um, and see why they solve their problems or find some books that show describe some complex math in simple ways um, like I've got some books on the history of physics that are good um, so people could get some ideas by Physics for the Inquiring Mind by Dr. Eric Rogers, um, or Introductory Physics by Herbert Priestley. Um, these are superior books than most books on physics because they go through things historically and then they therefore they show how people developed ideas and propositions in science and why they're true. Because you know most of the time children are not learning science they're learning what someone else knows about science they're learning someone else's ideas they're not learning how you know because to really do science and to know it it's an independent thing on your own if they're learning science then they'd be learning the content and the methods because science is about that it's essentially like very one way to look at it is the content, but another way to look at science, the concept is how it's a certain way of doing things. It's a way of thinking, identifying things, looking for cause effect relationships, building up the big picture. And so with these books, like they show how physics developed through history as a story, how one thing led to another. People are doing like research in electricity and they're studying because they're scientists, okay, how does it, electricity go through water? How does it go through fluids? How does it go through solids? Oh, it goes through metal better than some other things. Does it go through earth? What about trees and bark and grass? And how does it go through gases? And then when they're doing that, they start finding out about, out about these other particles and like gamma rays and x-rays and stuff like that. So then it is understandable what's going on and as opposed to all this stuff coming up out of nowhere and just following authority. But, but it, putting it in a, in a context that makes it engaging, and that's just like what we talked about with the history, that if it's just yeah. bold print terms, they look them up, they write them down. It's not set in the context of the centralization of power or power corrupting or some broader topic that, that engages them. Yeah, why is it important to human life? Why should I care? I mean, that's why we have knowledge, to survive and thrive and it's because we care about something, so bring in the caring. You know, this mind-body, and one reason we don't have some of that is because of bad philosophy, this mind-body dichotomy thing. 
Like, oh, you got to have a dispassionate, like, search for the truth. Nonsense. I have a passionate search for the truth. Um, I want to know what the truth is, you know, metaphorically speaking, the rest be damned. Like, I don't care about some of my emotion. It's got to go. If this is what's true and I want to survive, then to hell with these bad ideas. Some things I thought before, may they be damned. I want to stick to the truth. We should do a, an episode on the scientific method and yeah, scientific yeah. reasoning. Because uh, that's, that's what I start my psychology class with is scientific thinking, Occam's razor. Cool. Um, how do you how do you know something is true? The core question in epistemology. Yeah, been in a lot of stuff. And here's something I'll read. Um, this is from Introductory Physics by Herbert Priestley. Um, there's some part in here I just love the writing because of the um, complex sentences, and so I'll use this teaching grammar sometimes to show how people can use um, grammatical constructions to make a really good sentence. But, uh, you know, this is in a physics book. People are going to think, physics book's boring. Why should I read this? But um, in this, it'd be better to see and read it yourself because it's kind of complex, But so you get the idea. Um, he's talking about <clears throat> the chapter 6, the solar system and universal gravitation, introduction, um, 6.1, and then section 6.2, the sky. I'll just read a little bit. But... Um, he says, Early man was tremendously impressed with what he saw in the sky. Feeling that his welfare depended upon retaining their good will, he deified the sun and moon. By magic rites, he sought their blessing on him, his family, and his crops. He noted the regular rising, setting, and motion of the sun and moon and the orderly procession of the stars. This orderliness he first ascribed to the will of the gods, but his questioning mind gradually replaced myth and superstition with a more rational interpretation of celestial events and their causes, culminating in the Newtonian synthesis. This final overthrow of Aristotelian, Aristotelian logic by experimental science came only after a conflict between science and the church. The heavens appear today just as they did centuries ago. The sun, seemingly the largest body in the sky, daily rises in the east, climbs across the sky, and sets in the west. Its daily motion undergoes a series of regular changes, in points of time between rising and setting, and in noonday height in the sky. Accompanied by regular changes in weather, vegetation, etc., which we call the seasons. And he goes on to say more, but the parallelism in there and the writing of a physics professor, this is great. That's just beautiful. And as you were reading that passage, I was thinking that, you know, a good English teacher in teaching how to write is, is using examples from poems or from English authors. There's nothing wrong with that. A great English teacher would include a paragraph like that yeah. from physics and here's a piece from history true and these different fields and i and you're, you're getting different approaches of the human mind to language and thought yeah agreed and one thing i'd say here is um he says the final overthrow of aristotelian logic by experimental science that um we'll talk about that in the future but that's not yeah right. that, I'm just that caught my ear <laughs> please remember Priestley. um he's got a great book but he doesn't know everything um, he studied physics, not philosophy or the history of philosophy or history of science so much. So um, I make mistakes too. So, so what? But he's wrong. Aristotle's not so easy to overthrow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and so like there's a piece of writing. It's just like three paragraphs out of the whole big long book that shows how people can write about physics and chemistry um, in essays. It's not just a bunch of stuff write about and in the book it's great unlike a lot of modern books he actually quotes scientists um from what you know when they're talking about their experiments and he goes through um the thinking people were doing about heat 
electricity, the solar system, um, and there's plenty of topics students could write about, like in high school. Why did people believe that the moon, I mean, things on Earth and things in the heavens follow different laws, and why did they see that that was wrong? No math in there whatsoever. Zero. Total, like, physics and astronomy. Or what did ben Benjamin Franklin do to figure out and prove that lightning is electricity? Go through his thought process. Or how did people figure out that heat is a form of motion and not some, um, what did they call it? They thought that heat was like a imponderable particle. In other words, it didn't have weight. Um, I forgot the name right now. It's not coming to me, but they thought it was actually like a particle, like particles of other things, and um, that was mistaken. And um, what are the experiments? What did they do? How did they prove it? Sound, um, musical instruments, um, some modern physics. Talk about cause and effect and evidence and experiments, and it's writing. And then if people look up things about, um, what's his name, um, Robert Payne, maybe, I think it was him, he discovered uh, or formulated the concept of keystone species. There's a great deal they could write about that. The importance, <clears throat> like, how did the wolves of Yellowstone Valley change the valley and change the river? And that could be one topic you could write about through your whole life like a little kid writes a paragraph about it and then in junior high school they write a page and then in high school they write like a five page paper or a research paper about it so yeah. um, so there's some like um, hopefully that helps like there's some like really good ideas about how we can you know it's pretty clear a lot of people write in history and Literature, but we can also write a lot in like things about math and physics and chemistry and write about biographies of them. Um, great deal we can do. And then in English and well, in history, people could write more instead of just dates, but talk about causes and why something happened and look at it as a scientific experiment, like how they proved that we need individual rights or something like that or how they learned how a society should function. Well, and, and when you look at political systems, having an understanding of human nature, uh, if you look at communism, Nazism, et cetera, had a deeply flawed view of human nature. And now we're back to Adam Smith. How do we harness self-interest in order to serve other people? Right? You can do it with blind coercion like the Soviets did or a system in which their incentives lead them to serving other people mm -hmm. and you're going to get radically different outcomes. Yeah. And so again, that conversation has no names and dates per se. Yeah. No wars, no Kings. <laughs> right. It's not like 50 dates and years on a sheet of paper with a bunch of wars next to him. Doesn't have to be boring. Yeah. So how are things looking for you with time, Scott? You need to go soon, or we got a little more time, or what? Yeah, I'm getting short on time. Cool. All right, so um, I'll wrap it up really quickly then. Um, one thing we can discuss, I'd like to discuss more in the future, um, I wish I had this on video. Years ago, I tutored a student, and we were writing uh, an essay on the poem The Tiger by Blake. Mm -hmm. And man, um, and that's something I'd like to discuss someday, like take more time to fully develop it because uh, we worked for maybe an hour and a half or two hours on that. But, oh, geez, like there was so much you can talk about in that regard about definition, focus, big picture, thinking for yourself. Um, that's why I wish I had that thing on video because that was like such a great tutoring session. Um, in fact, it was so great, and he was maybe 10th grade, I don't think he even got everything we were doing, you know? It was great for yeah. him to experience it, but he'd have to experience it more again and again and have that trained in him.
for him to really understand and get it and make it a habit. You know, sometimes, no matter how great it is, if it's just one thing you see and then never see again, like, you don't know what to make of it and forget it. But, right. uh, um, we were just doing some really, really good work. Just love that teetering session. Wish I had it on video. <laughs> but, yeah, we can talk about that more in the future since you got to go. But, cool. Any last words, Scott? No, I uh, I think scientific method is coming soon because we've we've hinted at it a couple of times, and I think <laughs> we need to dive down and and ex- talk about and explain scientific reasoning. Awesome, sounds good. So yeah, we could talk about more writing in the future, but I think we got a heck of a lot nailed down and developed between the last podcast and this one. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to do was talk about how you can write in science because I think, you know, that was probably a big, um, would have been a big mystery to a lot of people because of the way science is thought of and taught in the culture. Um, oh, yeah, and then I forgot to mention, like, Dr. Michael Fowler. He's got some good work on the Internet um, about the history of physics. People could read that and kind of summarize some of that stuff or segue off it also, besides the books I mentioned here. Um He's got stuff. And if you homeschool and your kids are older, um, they could... He's got his materials available for physics, for homeschooling for free. Um, So people could look at that, download it. Um, It'd be some really good quality material to help them really make sense of it, as we were talking about. So, cool. So, um, yeah, that was good. Writing, it's important. Do it. It helps you think better. When you can think better, you can act better, you know, move, engage in action in the world, get your values, survive and thrive. Sounds good. So let's, yeah, I guess we'll both go do a little thinking and writing and surviving (laughs) and thriving ourselves. So thank you, Scott. All right. Enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Okay. Talk to you soon.